So uh, thank you, Dibesh, and thank all of you for being here. Um, it's a strange proposition to uh, have to speak about a book, and that to a, a, book, a picture book, a photo book, because ideally uh, you should actually have your hands on it, uh, and I hope that some of you will. Um, it's, a, it's not simply a book of photographs that we are here to talk about, because um, a, a photo book is a, is a, is a genre of its own, uh, to which I myself sort of fell into it, uh, having decided to make a book like this. It's not something that I work with. I'm a documentary filmmaker. Uh, but what I'm going to do, um, and <coughs> Natasha and I will have a conversation which will hopefully be as much about Kashmir as it is about the book, what I'm going to do is to briefly describe the, the architecture of the book to you. Um, because not to be pedantic, but to because I think that by sketching out what the book contains, we have a framework within which a conversation can take place. So uh, this uh, lovely room has this device which allows me to actually um, walk you through the book, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time. But just to tell you that as a book of photographs, um, uh, you know, there are multiple ways in which a book can walk you through an image. And uh, I think that the physical shape of the book tries to capture some of that. There are straightforward, you know, displays. There are more dramatic foldouts, which work like this. Uh, I'm not being able to show you the whole image, but I will. Um, there is uh, you know, if you, you, you can you can have images that are spread across pages. You have images that open out like this. So, in a sense, the the the, the narrative of a photo book can actually be constructed from its use. I mean, the uh, 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 an image which is used part uh, displayed partially uh, with a little bit of text can also then be revealed in all its. Um, Sometimes it's horror and sometimes it's uh, delight. Um, and as we go through the book, uh, there are multiple ways in which these forms are repeated. And, and I, I'm taking the trouble of walking you through the physical sort of dimensions of the book because I think that that's not unimportant to how the book works. Uh, you don't always reveal an image initially and when you open it out, then it allows you to read it in, in several steps. Sometimes there are uh, unexpected <coughs> surprises. Uh, if I open to the work of, say, for example, Shokat Nanda, uh, who works, who has done a very interesting series of portraits of uh, boys on the run. I mean, these are young boys who are hiding from uh, the police in the a small town of Baramula. Uh, then what happens is that you can actually you open it and things fall out sometimes. In this case, postcards, portraits of the boys. So this is just to sort of suggest to you uh, the, the, the form. And I think, uh, I mean, In my case, uh, for at least uh, at least since for the last decade, um, I'm a Kashmiri by birth, although I didn't grow up there. Um, and the work that I have done over the last decade uh, is an attempt to find various ways in which one can speak about Kashmir. So it began with a long documentary that I made, uh, that I finished in 2007, called Jashne Azadi, How We Celebrate Freedom, which is a, a documentary film. I think there are copies available here. Uh, but I did, in 2010, I put together an anthology of writings uh, of, by young people who had been uh, shaped by the uh, tremendous upsurge of 2010, the huge public unrest. And, uh, and now this book. And why I'm drawing 
attention to these is not because I'm trying to tell you my CV of what all I've done, but because each time it's been an attempt to find a new way of creating a new space in which uh, a new space, a new language, and hopefully a new audience for uh, the work. So I'm going to um, switch to a, a very sort of uh, quick uh, walk through to the photographers and who they are because it will give you some idea of what we are talking about. I'm going to keep this lamp off. Oh, should I not have done that? Yeah, just we won't interfere with that. We just, uh, Witness is what the book is called. Uh, some of you may have noticed that uh, when, when I opened the book, that the word in, in, in Roman, in Hindi, in, 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 in the Devanagari script, and in Urdu uh, says Shahid. And interestingly, the, in, in both in, in Arabic and in Urdu, uh, the word Shahid, Shahid, uh, is a word that bridges the uh, sometimes unbridgeable gap between the witness and the martyr. The same word is used for both. And I I interestingly, it was pointed out to me when we were putting the book together that even in Greek, the word martis, which, is, uh, which gives rise to the word martyr, uh, is actually the word for witness. So, so across cultures and languages, there is this, uh, this perception that once you witness something, you are also a martyr to it, you know, which is the kind of premise of this book. That these are nine photographers whose work uh, of witnessing what has happened in Kashmir has, in a sense, also produces, uh, makes a kind of martyr of them. So this is witness, and the time period we're talking about is Kashmir 1986, 2016. And it's the work of nine photographers. Now, this period, 1986, 2016, is actually what we would call the period of the troubles in Kashmir. In a sense, the 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 the, the, the issue of Kashmir is a much older one. Uh, if you if you want to, you could very easily trace it back to five centuries, but you could certainly trace it uh, to 1947. Uh, but the period that of 1986-2016, which is a 30-year period, is actually a period of intense uh, tumult. It begins with public uh, sort of uh, protests. It morphs into an armed struggle. Uh, it leads to an intense and very brutal counterinsurgency. Uh, and then, so these are these are cycles which come and go. And now, at least for the last decade with uh, a huge uh, public, uh, sometimes, um, let's say, I, I don't know how to use that word, non-violent, but not, it's not always an armed uh, struggle. There are various shades to it. So uh, the first of the nine photographers is Meraj Din, who is the oldest, is born in 1959, uh, which really means that in 1986 he was a, a full-fledged professional, he was a photographer, um, possibly the, the, the first uh, formal photojournalist in Kashmir. This image taken during a crackdown in a downtown home in, in, in Srinagar. If there's time, I'll tell you a little bit about this image uh, when we have the discussion. Uh, this, the assassination of a judge, Justice Nilkar Ganju, uh, uh, which marked actually the first of a series of political assassinations which led uh, to, to an intense period of bloodletting in the early 1990s. Uh, this from an anti-election campaign uh, in the uh, town of Anantana. Uh, the coffin is placed in the middle of the street. Uh, those who can read Urdu or through the haze could read that it says that, you know, the person who is, who had, who, who is willing to vote can take this car away for free. Gadi moves to Melayasate, free Melayasate. Meaning that it's a kind of threat that if you dare to vote, then this is the what you're going to get. Uh, it's a you know a coffin, and you can see a policeman walk, walking in the back of the room. 
So some of these negatives are in quite badly marked as you can see. And this was a consequence of the 2014 flood in which a lot of photographers lost a lot of material. And although we have restored some of it, sometimes as in this image, we have chosen to, to retain some of the damage because we believe that that is part of the historical artifact. You know, the fragility of the film negative and the fact that the, it went into the water and the markings must be retained. This, uh, in the aftermath of the destruction of the shrine of Tsar Sharif, which is probably one of the most revered Sufi shrines, where uh, at, at one very crucial stage uh, in, in the period of the armed struggle, uh, a well known um, militant commander pulled himself up inside the shrine and the Indian army went into a battle mode and eventually the shrine was reduced to rubble. Uh, this very iconic image uh, of a massacre in the small town of Bijbihara, uh, where 52 people were killed uh, in a firing by the, by the BSF. Uh, the light strip on the left is uh, because the uh, Berajuddin's camera was snatched by a soldier and the film was exposed. Um, even as, and as you can see, the bodies are long gone because he, he reached there later in the day. But just the sight of the slippers was obviously incendiary enough. And when he dug out his negatives for us, he actually found the full strip. So we've actually reproduced the strip in the book, which just, this is the only two frames which survived the opening of the thing. Uh, I'm just going to read you some small sections from the, the what they have said to me in the conversation and he says, this is Mirajuddin, I began to carry two identity cards in two different pockets, one in my shirt and another in my pants. In case something happened, I wanted people to know who they had found. Every day was full of such sights. At one grenade blast, I saw an elderly man rushing around helping to pick up victims tirelessly until he turned over this one body and realized it was his own son. All of us photographers wept that day. The second of the photographers, Javed Shah, uh, born in 67. Uh, Javed was for a very long period uh, the photographer for the Indian newspaper, Indian Express. And uh, when I started traveling back to Kashmir in 2003, um, I think one of, the, one of the ways in which we, I began to see Kashmir very differently was because of the work of Javed Shah. You know, he was... Um, he was a photojournalist working for a daily newspaper, but there was something about his image making which was very unusual. Um, and interestingly, he had a very interesting relationship with the, with the desk that he reported to in New Delhi, who carried these pictures. So I find it quite unusual that a, a daily newspaper would have featured images of this kind um, on its front pages as pictures of what was going on in Kashmir. Uh, this, uh, sorry, the, the previous image was of a young uh, Fedain who was killed uh, while attacking a police post in Srinagar. Uh, this is a, after the, in the aftermath of an avalanche uh, in a small village called Vardengu. Uh, those are the corpses pulled out of the snow and being ready for burial. Um, like everybody else here, I have several birthdays. Call it intuition, telepathy, whatever, but I do believe in it. Because that's the only way you can survive this place. Why did I start shooting so many of those distorted reflections those days? Maybe it was to mirror the madness that had taken over our streets. An experiment of sorts. Or a sign of my frustration at what was going on. Who can say? Dar Yassin, the third <coughs> of the photographers in the book, uh, much younger, born in 1973. Uh, Dar Yassin is a photographer. He works for the Associated Press. He's the, he, he's the kind of person who has to, every morning, step out, make a picture, file it. It's a job. He just does it every day. And I find those kinds of practitioners very interesting also. Because there's something about the rigor of everyday photojournalism, of having to file a picture at the end of every day, very interesting. So you can see how, you know, in the, these are the Friday protests which happen every week and have been happening every week for as long as Dar Yassin has been taking pictures. And yet you can see him looking for things that happen, uh, form. Um, this image taken in the aftermath of an encounter with militants where the family have been robbed by the security forces. So it, you know, it's kind of at the back of the action. 
and this quite iconic picture of, of a funeral of a militant commander in 2014. I was shooting once near the HMT factory on the outskirts of Srinagar. It was a day-long encounter with militants, and the army was keeping us far from the gun battle. When it was over and all of us photographers rushed in, I got busy looking at the bodies, taking pictures, the usual. Suddenly I had the feeling that the place looked oddly familiar and stopped. When I looked around, I realized that the place I was standing in was the burnt out shell of my old school. I was so shaken, I must have stood there for several minutes, my ears ringing, unable to move. <coughs> Javed Dar. Um, Javed Dar is a, and the thing I have to tell you about most of these photographers, they're, they're completely unschooled. I mean, with one exception, none of them have been to a, a media school or a school of photojournalism. They are all people who just learned. Javed comes from a village uh, uh, not far from uh, the small town of Anantna. When I met him first in 2004, he was uh, shooting pictures on one of those, you know, <coughs> whatever they call it, snap. You know, those little digital cameras. He was a district correspondent of a, uh, a Srinagar newspaper. I think he was being paid a salary of 500 rupees a month. So uh, today he's the uh, photographer for the Chinese news agency Xinhua and again he's somebody who's out there every day but always looking for something which is, you know, which doesn't necessarily make a news picture. This is uh, an image of uh, uh, Asiya Andravi who heads the Dokhtarani Millet which is a sort of conservative uh, women's uh, group which is sort of pro-Pakistan and, uh, uh, and pro-Azadi. Freedom. Uh, this image from a protest uh, by government employees, the purple dye is what is sprayed on the, on the protesters to mark them so that you can't pretend that you were not there. Oh, a funeral uh, in, a, in a village. This rather unusual image of migrant laborers uh, who, uh, this, you know, for those of you who know a little bit about Kashmir, one of the under written about things is that every year more than 250,000 migrant labor go from India and labor in Kashmir as construction workers and uh, they, they, this particular lot make uh, brooms uh, out of the uh, straw in the fields and his uh, quite iconic picture in the aftermath of a fire in the village of Frisland, uh, the small town near the tourist town of uh, Pehlgaan. I can remember the day the first crackdown happened in our village. I had just finished my matric exam. It was June 9, 1992. The army arrived early in the morning and they came in trucks, so we knew this was not going to be routine. We were meant to start planting paddy that day and I left the house early. The first day of planting was a sort of festival in Kashmir. We were stopped by the soldiers as we walked to the far end of the village and told to go back home. My father tried to argue, but they said, no, boys like him are the terrorists. Altaf Kadri, um, uh, he's a photographer also with the Associated Press, he's now based in New Delhi, but he used to be, uh, he used to work in Kashmir with uh, the European Photo Press Agency. I think he has won pretty much every uh, important uh, prize uh, for photojournalists in the world. Uh, this is one of his earlier pictures, a policeman in the aftermath of a grenade attack in central Srinagar. Um, this one about a shopkeeper beaten by a policeman during a protest. This somewhat disturbing image of a policeman being carried away. I, I, I put it into this PowerPoint because the hand on the left side of the frame holding the policeman is actually the photographer's hand. It tells you something about the kind of position that photographers who work in their home are situated in. Because for them, they're shooting their own people, and their own people include sometimes the policemen, sometimes it includes those who are getting shot, so it's a very it's a ambiguous, muddy territory in which you function. This funeral of a militant commander in a village, and this of three militants killed. These are amongst his earlier pictures, most of them are at least eight or nine years old. A man had been blown up, I'm now uh, reading from Altaf Kadri's. A man had been blown up while diffusing an improvised explosive device in Palhalan village. At least that's what the newspapers in Srinagar had reported. Later that morning, when we photographers got there, the people of the village were so angry, they were ready to lynch us. 
We ended up being chased through the village for almost 300 meters before a conversation could even be started. You only carry the army version, the furious young men said to us. Whatever they say matters, what we say never gets reported. It usually takes a lot of persuasion by the buzurg, the village elders, to restore the balance. Still, I always like to talk and never give up without arguing for what I believe in. Whether I end up getting slapped up or beaten, no issue, that's part of it. It connects to what I was telling you that, you know, for them, there isn't that distance of the photojournalist who arrives from outside, is there to make a great picture, and then get out. You know, these are people who know that they're going to be going back there next week, you know, next day, next month. And so um, uh, the police know them, the pe protesters know them, the families know them. So it's a, it's a relatively unusual situation in which the images are being made. Uh, by people who are deeply part of that society, you know, they're not they're not the journalists who come in for a day or a week and do their stuff, and and they have the safety of the exit. Sumit Dayal, uh, Sumit Dayal is a uh, is in a, in a sense uh, he's there in the book because he's a very interesting disruptive influence. Um, Sumit, uh, his family are. Uh, Okay, so it, it, that's not why he's in the book, but he's the only non-Muslim in the in the in the book, and it's very interesting because his family originally from Srinagar, they migrated to Nepal quite early in the 70s, and uh, Shubhit is a very accomplished um, photographer. He he trained at the International Center for Photography in New York, which is a very sort of blue chip place for photographers. Um, he's done the you know, the high end of photojournalism, for whatever it's worth, he shot three covers for Time magazine of uh, India's current Prime Minister Narendra Modi, the, um, the Indian cricketing legend uh, Sachin Tendulkar, the film star Amir Khan. So what I'm trying to suggest is that he's done the kind of high end of photojournalism. But his own work in Kashmir was deeply personal. And it was part of something that he called going home because he went back in 2009 trying to understand as somebody who had left, whose family had left, what it meant to go back. And he works uh, not in color, he only shoots on 400 ASA black and white film. He carries a bag with five different cameras. None of them are fancy high-end cameras. He works with really um, eccentric uh, very cheap Russian cameras, panoramic cameras, um, a, a whole range of what would be called more avant-garde uh, cameras. So his work uh, is characterized, I mean, he shoots the same thing that everybody else is shooting, but you can see that the image making is very, very distinct. Portraits, and very, uh, his work, since it's not photojournalistic, it's often shared in unusual ways. So this is one of the ways in which he sh this looks like an ordinary contact strip. Many of you are too young to know what a contact strip <laughs> is. But when you shot negative film, this is how you got your uh, images. So what he does is he creates contact strips. So he take elements of stories from different places, piece them together in a kind of narrative, and then he invites the viewer to see it on a table, on a light table. So it's a you know a table which is lit from below, and he has a loop. A loop is a magnifying kind of glass. So it is a very intense experience because you actually are forced to lean forward and look for details. So it's a storytelling technique which uh, Shubit is. And more recently, he started working with found images. You know, in a sense, kind of saying that why are we continually creating more images? If we want to tell stories, why can't we look at images that exist. So he began going into his family album, creating composites where, in this case, an image he has shot of a horse crossing the cemetery wall in winter is composited with the back of a postcard written by his grandfather, which you see in the previous, which says, wish you live long, best wishes, Dayal. And he's kind of made a composite out of it. So he's doing a lot of this layered kind of stuff. The interesting thing about Shumit is that Although you, you would see him, his work as a kind of avant-garde experimental practice, he's also very close to all the other photographers and has had a wonderful influence on all of them because they, they, know, they, they have no exposure to this world. So through his persona and his continuous uh, trips back home, he's actually 
that's why I use the word disruptive, that he's kind of forcing them to think about the kinds of images that they make. I'm not, this is, in, is not in, entirely in his voice because this is my conversation from, with him. I'm not done with my work in Kashmir. I'm not done with all that. When I go back, I'll do something that a large number of people will understand. I need to pull myself back from a level of abstraction and take the work to some other level, he said. In the tales of ghosts who want to be set free, what holds them back is memory, Shumit had written some years ago. There is a certain grip about my childhood memories from Kashmir and a past I must unfold to know who I am. It is here at home that I searched for the experience of being in a space where, and here Sumit cut himself short and turned to T.S. Eliot, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Sayesh, uh, Shokat Nanda, very, very interesting uh, photographer. He is from a small town in North Kashmir called Baramulla. Mm -hmm. He went to school there, he went to college there. He left for two years because he got a fellowship to study photojournalism in the US, but came right back, lives there, works there. And most of his images are shot literally within 50 kilometers of his home. So he's somebody who's deeply committed to continuously mapping his own neighborhood. And I think that makes him very interesting. This is an early image by 2004, I think, of women protesting in Lange. Uh, this is part of the series I told you about of Boys on the Run, which is basically he, he, he earned the trust of the young men who were on the run, and then he followed them and made pictures in the places that they were hiding. In this case, it's a, it's a, it's a cemetery, a graveyard, but in some cases, abandoned buildings, uh, as in this case, uh, more sort of journalistic images. At some point during our conversation, this is again not in his voice, but at some point during our conversation, we found ourselves stopping in the middle of Cement Bridge. On a December afternoon in 1989, it was the site of a massive public celebration, a spontaneous outburst after five Kashmiri militants were released from prison. The next day, on the back foot and still seething, the police opened fire in an innocuous protest near the bridge. Some thought of it as a targeted killing, a lesson to the boisterous town. One of those killed was a teenager, Parvais, Shokat's cousin. A few months later, in March 1990, Shokat's older brother, Sajjad, quietly slipped away from the house. Only 16 at the time, Sajjad had joined the newly emerged Students' Liberation Front, and like thousands of other young men in Kashmir who went looking for training in handling arms, he crossed over the line of control to Pakistan-controlled Kashmir. The reason I picked this uh, little section from the profile is because it tells you something of the backstory of the photographers. And in a sense, while this is a book about Kashmir, it's, it's, it's a book about nine photographers, it's also not just about their photography, it's about who they are. So each uh, photographer's work is accompanied by what we call a profile, but that's really a long, it has come out of a long series of conversations with each of them. So in a sense, it's also a social history of uh, what it meant to have lived through these 30 years that we've described. Sayed Shahriyar, very young, born 1992. Uh, he's a photojournalist. This is a 2016 image of an event that triggered off uh, almost four months of complete standstill in uh, Kashmir. This was the killing of the militant commander Burhan Wani and this rather remarkable picture that uh, Sayed Shahriyar took. This uh, image, which is of a police van making an announcement about, actually about uh, a rumor about poisoned uh, polio vaccine. Um, uh, Sayed Shahriyar is also, he, he's, uh, he comes from the Shia community in Kashmir, which is a tiny sort of minority in an otherwise uh, uh, wider Sunni Muslim society, and is very determinedly documenting aspects of a Shia life, including the Moharram. So he's been for several years been shooting Moharram with a very, very beautiful set of black and white images. This is one. Another one. And this. Till a few years ago, we tried to position ourselves on the side of the protesters. It gave us a very different perspective on their battles with the paramilitary. 
But that changed completely after 2013. It's become too dangerous for the photographers. Pellet guns are everything for the police now. I don't understand it. They seem to love these pellet guns. It's like a narcotic for them. Sometimes at the protest, they shoot people in the leg, even when the stone throwing is not too heavy, just so that they can identify them later. A sort of tag. And at the end of the book, uh, Azan Shah, who is, I can, the only way I can describe him is as absurdly young. He is not even 20 uh, as yet. Um, he will turn 20 later this year. He uh, sees himself as a street photographer. Uh, he uh, barely has made it through school. His parents have had to sort of cycle him through seven different uh, schools in order just to get him to finish. Uh, but his work is already so striking. Um, shoots very unusual things. He's not interested in what everybody else shoots. Uh, uh, almost obsessively shoots the streets, looking for shadows, patterns. Uh, very, very interesting. And if he does go out to shoot during a protest, this is the kind of image that he will come back with. You have to accept what is around you and then try to make pictures. That's what I try to do. But you have to start in the morning because things get messy in the day. Would I like to be invisible? Well, I've been taking a lot of pictures on my smartphone recently. It's made me realize the beauty of imperfection in photography. Sharpness is overrated. And I don't like photos that are too sharp or too perfect in terms of dynamic range. Nor do I like photos that are cropped perfectly. Real life and the streets are not perfect. It's the imperfect edges of a photograph that give it realness. So that's it. Nine photographers, Kashmir, 1986, 2016. And the book, yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. That was a brilliant walk through through a book, through the book, and we all got a sense of what the book has. And as you can probably see from from the way it's put together, uh, it's very thoughtful. And there's there's something quite symbolic about the way you open the book and the postcards that are in there and the fold out images. So I wanted to uh, start by saying that it has been a pleasure and a privilege to see this book and to have it and I would encourage you to you know to get copies of it if you can um, and to congratulate Sanjay on this on this book. Uh, secondly I would like to acknowledge I would like for us to imagine that there were nine other people in this room who are the nine photographers and uh, you know and they can't be here as we know you know this there's a whole set of reasons we couldn't even get Skype connected, but uh, you know, but Sanjay's work and and this is a memorialization of the resilience and their engagement with their surroundings. Um, the the word witness, you know, this book is called Witness, and um, I know some of you know about Kashmir, but others would like to know more. And since some of you are my students, I can I can I know that. So uh, Aga Shahid Ali, who's a you know who is a Kashmiri American poet, he has uh, his work on his his writings on the Beloved Witness has this beautiful line about you know the thing about history getting in the way of memory, and and if you look at Kashmir and you look at the different kinds of Kashmiri lives uh, both inside and outside Kashmir, and we are a very small part of that, uh, there is that whole question of history and memory, and. Um, and to those of you who haven't been to Kashmir, I would like to just say, you know, Sanjay used the word crackdown. And uh, to, to people here, we would not, you know, it's not something we are familiar with. But words like crackdowns, militants, bunkers, surrendered militants, curfews, you know, shootouts, are just part and parcel of the vocabulary of people, uh, you know, including an entire generation that has only grown up seeing pretty much that. So this is, you know, so we are here in this room and we are sitting here. But to think that when we go out, there would be guns, there would be soldiers at every corner, we could at any time be interrupted by anything, that is the kind of thing you have to imagine when you imagine, you know, uh, what Kashmiris, uh, you know, and these people have been living with. And in that, uh, you know, with that sort of as, a, as the backdrop, I would like you to have that as the backdrop of, uh, you know, of the book. Um, so two of the things that this book uh, does is one, I think that, uh, you know, as Sanjay explains in his introduction, it's a witnessing, it's a memorialization, it's finding that space in the public memory 
to, to make sure that these things are not forgotten. So that's, that's one important thing that it does. And secondly, uh, I, you know, it's, it also looks at the entire uh, role of photography and photojournalism as, as an art form in Kashmir. So as, as something that is, that is growing and, and as Sanjay said, um, you know, one of the only art forms that's actually safely growing. So I would like to maybe pose some questions to Sanjay as a way of beginning the conversation. And the first one I would just say, why, you know, we've talked about this earlier, but why a book rather than an exhibition? And why the focus on photography as opposed to any other kind of art form? So, uh, as with anything uh, that one ends up doing, it begins with a personal, personal fascination. And in 2003, when I first began thinking of doing a film in Kashmir, um, I was having a great deal of difficulty getting people to talk about what life was like in the 90s, which is the period of uh, tremendous violence, you know. Um, especially, you know, when you want them to talk to camera, it was almost impossible. And because people were very hesitant to speak up, it was not simply fear, but it was also kind of an inability to come to terms with the experience that many people had been through in the 90s. And I started looking at the work of photographers and uh, I was very struck by what I saw because uh, you know the work of photojournalists normally appears in very fragmentary ways in the media. You know, you see a picture, you see a great picture and you say, wow, what a nice picture and then you forget about it. And then, you know, maybe a month later you see another picture and so it, it was a kind of flow which never got uh, taken seriously, you know. Um, and I always sort of fantasized that how wonderful it would be to kind of stem the flow a little bit, you know, to pick some pictures and put them together and say, what does this mean, you know. Um, and so, in a sense, the idea was in my head for a long time. And uh, for some obscure reason, which I'm not fully uh, able to articulate or theorize as yet, uh, I wanted it to be a book. You know, I did not want it to be an exhibition, uh, at least initially. One day it might be, but right now, I said it's first got to be a book. I, it's, it doesn't have to be some interactive website, or, although it could very easily be that. And, and not to put a, a sort of a hierarchy of value to it, but I think that there's something about the mm, there's something about the sagacity of the book as a form and the, its ability to make you stop, its ability to take you back and forth, and, and like I said, the physicality of the book was to me a very, very interesting form. So actually speaking, as a documentary filmmaker, I don't think I had to look very far away for inspiration because it was like putting together a documentary film, which, you know, where there is a certain kind of material and then you look for a form for it, except that in a film it's like, you know, it's, one dimensional uh, experience, but in a book you can make it. So, um, in a sort of uh, slightly uh, archaic uh, way of thinking, I said, I don't care if there are only like a thousand copies of this book in the world, but I want there to be a book. Because I want the work of these photographers and I want those years to be put together in a form that we know will survive that the flood will not take away those negatives and will not take away the digital hard drives and that you know we are able to uh, it doesn't matter if there are only a hundred copies that survive in different corners of the world but there will be those hundred copies mm -hmm. many of these people don't have many more than the pictures that i put in the book because they lost them you know that photographers photojournalists don't store their work so yes it was a combination of wanting to um, so sort of slow down the flow of images, of presenting them in a form that will make them meaningful, um, and also to preserve in an old-fashioned sort of way, in print with ink and uh, mm -hmm. up the lights a little bit. It's a bit gloomy out here. Um, I'll, 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 I think the book actually begins with a quote uh, about what is not uh, what is not remembered is. Uh, it's a quote from John Berger, what is remembered has been saved from nothingness, what is forgotten has been abandoned. Um, 
So, you know, um, one of the interesting things, and, and you got glimpses of it when Sanjay showed you, showed you extracts from their, from their own, uh, you know, text uh, or from conversations. It's that the text is almost as interesting as the pictures because it's not just about a, a pictorial journey. It's also about how these people came to, to the camera. How did they came to be the people who would pick up this camera and decide that that's what they wanted to do? And in some cases, it was, uh, you know, reading from this, in some cases it was literally a, a, a thing that having a, you know, you go through an episode where you almost, you know, you have like a second birthday because you almost died. And you think, well, if I had the camera, and if, if I could have documented some of that, maybe that's some sort of a guarantee against that not happening so blatantly to me. You know, if you're harassed in the street and you're beaten up, you just think, if I had a camera. So in some cases it was that, and I found that quite interesting in terms of how the people got to the cameras. And, and at other times, the camera seemed to be almost, I think it's, uh, it's Shokananda who says that uh, it's not the extract we saw, but it's this point where he, you know, he has a boy die in his arms, and uh, in, in, at this, you know, during this, um, protest and he says I wanted to scream, I wanted to throw stones, but I had this burden of photography around my neck. I had this um, you know this this thing of being a photographer in that situation. So I just wonder if you could reflect a little bit about you know the the visibility and the involvement of a of a person with a camera in a situation like that. Because in some cases, you know, there's there's people who said, well up until to, after two thousand eight especially we decided that we couldn't, most of us didn't want to be on, you know, facing the police because you could, you could, you could be hit by these pellets. You heard the word pellets, they're metal pellets, shot nowhere, you know, sh with which protesters are shot. They, they, they are blinded, there were numerous blindings last year. So about this visibility and involvement and the positioning of the photojournalists in a situation like that. I think that uh, many of the photographers who began taking pictures in the 90, 1990s and even into the 2000s did it because they thought it was a kind of uh, protection. Because uh, you know when you have curfews, which means you can't step out of your house maybe for a week, for two weeks, for three weeks, um, the only way you can step out is that if you have a press card. So having a press identification became a kind of way of getting out. And uh, being a photographer also meant a kind of liberation, you know, because if you're a photographer, you got onto your bike, the police, well, you might have to argue at five barriers, but you, you also get through five barriers. So uh, to be a young man and be confined to the home for weeks on end, uh, the, 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 the role of the photographer seemed a kind of way of getting out of it, you know. Uh, in the earlier pictures, you also see that Obviously, all kinds of doors open. You know, if you were a photographer, well, the militants wanted their pictures, so they would invite you to take their pictures, and so on and so forth. But as the counterinsurgency became more and more brutal, uh, the militancy kind of disappeared underground, uh, and the militant only reappeared as a dead body at a funeral. You know, and for the photographers, the the spaces that they could go to became more and more constrained. So if you notice, a lot more pictures are now made only during public protests because that's where the people protect them. On their own, the photographer is not a match to the security guy with the gun. You know, he can't get away with it. So you, there's a kind of protection in going when there's a 2,000 people protesting because... So it's interesting that images also start getting made depending on where you can go to, you know. And this is a kind of material fact of making of images that people often forget about, that, you know, that it's not, the photographers don't always choose where they're going to be able, able to go. But I think that uh, it's almost a cliche that all of them see themselves as storytellers. I think it's a word that all of them must have used at least once, you know, I want to tell my story. I wanted to tell that story of how I was used as a human shield by police, by paramilitary police. I want to tell the story of that boy who died in my arm. I want to tell the story. Everybody has a story to tell. And in a sense, in an area of conflict, um, that is the real uh, purpose and definition of art in some ways. You know, it, in, in the absence of other ways, I mean, with the internet, with 
Facebook, with blogs, some of that changed. Young people started using writing and I think the only other area in which young Kashmiris are as kind of articulate is in writing, you know, especially on the net. Uh, people write very well, they write very confidently, they write very fearlessly. Uh, so I think that self-expression, which is not, uh, I'm just trying to think, and is not an area that I know a lot about, but I don't think conventionally photojournalists don't think of photojournalism as a way of their telling their stories. They want to tell other people's stories. You know. But in Kashmir, uh, almost all the photographers first and foremost see it as their story. I have to tell the story of my people. You know, That's why I'm taking that risk. That's why I'm going into that slightly dicey place. Because Not because they're only heroic, but it's just there's a kind of urgency to it that the story must get through. Mm -hmm. And you know, this telling of stories, I, I found the, the transit, the sort of, the, the different photographers' view of what they were doing become really interesting when we get to the last photographer, uh, you know, Azan Shah, who's, uh, who's 20 or yeah, 19. 19. So his, you know, because his, he's quite clear, he doesn't want to be a photojournalist who just supplies these, these images and he has a very particular and rather if you know, if one thinks of an artist as a phenomenologist of the peripherals, he has this way of you know going to a scene and then looking at what might be missed otherwise, rather than what is what is just central. And and because he is you know because he is of a different generation, and perhaps that reflects the evolution of that you know artistic subjectivity. I wonder if and you know it's it's a question that I'm sure you've been asked before. In that, you know, when, when we come to the present generation, why are there no women in, in this? Why are there no, you know, in, in that age group? Was it, what are the sort Because they, they experience it, and are there ways that they reflect or express that? And if so, what, what was your experience when looking for photographers? So, um, obviously, in, in the course of selecting the photographers and the images, uh, it was something that I was quite conscious of that there was it was important to find women photographers. But um, and it's not that there I couldn't find any women who had taken pictures. There was some, but uh, since there was a sort of self-imposed brief that these would be photojournalists, then there were no women photojournalists. And this question actually came up in a very interesting way in when the we released the book in Delhi recently. Uh, which was on the 15th of February, and somebody asked this question in the audience, and it was very interesting because there were eight of the photographers were on stage, and all of them were men, and they all fumbled furiously. None of them had a really good answer, you know. Um, somebody said, "Yeah, you know, you could do this. You could take, yeah, women should take pictures of the home space, and women should do this, and so on." Uh, so there wasn't really a satisfactory resolution to uh, that question. But the next day. On Facebook, I began to read some very, very interesting comments by young Kashmiri women. You know, one of them wrote and said that, you know, uh, how can you even begin to ask about women coming out of the street as photojournalists in a place where violence and sexual violence is such an important part of what goes on in the street? You know, and so. Uh, some other women wrote to me and uh, gave me links to their own blogs and so on, saying this is the work I do. And look, I don't have a problem with the fact that we didn't have women in the book, but isn't it time that women also did something? So, uh, yes, there is an absence, and yes, we know why they're not there, but then often that's not enough of a, uh, it's not, not a satisfactory answer. Uh, but I think that one of the nice things that's come out of the book is Shokat Nanda, whose work you, you saw. Uh, Shokat has been running workshops for uh, yeah, very young people in Kashmir and often at least a third of his class is uh, our young women. Um, but he said to me, he said, look, I'm, I think I'm going to do another workshop this year and this time I'll ensure that you know, at least half of them are women. And that, you know, so in a sense, in a perverse sort of way, the fact that we weren't able to find women photographers is kind of led to a situation in, in which a conversation about this has uh, has begun. The, uh, the other, um, I guess the other question is, 
is something you refer to in the introduction, and you use the word inexplicably, and you refer to how you know there aren't enough images of the exodus of Kashmiri bandits, and you know you and I, especially in the way we would be seen, it's it's a question that that we must address. Is uh, if you could expand a little bit more on you know on the absence of those images, we have yes uh, you know some of the images of the massacre yes. and the killing of, of the just uh, you know of Justice Sanjeev, but but what what were the obstacles to their not being visible? So, so for those who don't uh, know the contours of what happened in Kashmir, uh, one of the especially in the Indian context, one of the very important. Um, Sort of, uh, I don't know how to describe it. Another, a very in sort of almost tectonic uh, break in the life of Kashmir was that in the early 90s, uh, the Kashmiri pundits, who are a minority of Hindus, uh, actually left Kashmir out of fear, out of uh, panic, all kinds of complicated reasons. We, we don't, you know, we don't want to get into the detail of it. And um, they are a very tiny minority less than 5%. But they had a rather inordinate influence in Kashmiri society. So their leaving of it was not a minor thing. As, uh, incidentally, Nitash and I both actually, if we want to be identified, then that's how we would be seen. We are Kashmiri pundits. Well, we prefer to identify yes, Kashmiris. Yes. Um, which makes us about only 2 out of uh, 300,000. No, there's a few more. <laughs> so uh, the thing is that uh, and this has been actually the, 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 the migration of the Kashmiri pundits has been used rather, um, I would say, savagely to beat down the, uh, the politics of what goes on in Kashmir. To say that you know you couldn't protect your own minorities and what kind of freedom are you talking about? You know? And uh, in Indian politics, it remains a very very important thing. If you open the Indian magazines and newspapers or you Google them. I don't think there's a week that goes past, where even now, 30 years later, that there will not be a mention of the migration of Kashmiri pundits and how terrible it was. Which it was terrible, and it, it has affected life in Kashmir in very important ways. So one of the puzzles for me was that if a community of 250,000 people actually left, where are the pictures? You know, and according to received wisdom, people left in 1990, you know. So I started asking around that, you know, if, if everything was being photographed, how was this not photographed? And I don't have a, a full answer, and I'm sort of happy to be uh, proven wrong and have somebody um, find those pictures, but it, it tells you something about what the omniscient witnessing sometimes will not witness. We don't know why. You know, obviously those 250,000 people did leave, but in what circumstances, in what ways. So, in a sense, the absence of those images actually ends up um, uh, raising more important questions than their presence would have uh, actually fulfilled. Hence, you use the word inexplicable, yes. just like I asked about it. Um, Two other things, if I may vary about the, you know, the images. I, I felt that at various places, I don't know if this was a conscious choice, but the, the images indicated also a vulnerability of the occupation. As much as its brutality, there was also, uh, you know, when you look at the police and you look at the ways in which all of that. So I wondered whether that was, whether that was more the choice of images or whether that was something that the photographers had chosen themselves to tell that story of you know how the occupation is vulnerable too and linked to that this other question that you know why why well i i do not why but i suppose what was the rationale in not including some of the more uh, immediate images that one would think of, like Kunan Koshkura or you know, or Chhatsingura or Kurhan uh, you know, those kinds of images. We, why don't we see them directly? Was there? I'm sure that was you know, there was a thinking behind that. So I just yeah. want to know more. So uh, Kunan Koshkura, again, for those who don't know, was the site of a very, very uh, infamous incident in which uh, army soldiers entered this village, and um, there was a kind of mass rape. Uh, low end estimates are that 30 women were raped, high end 
this AP, uh, AP was never properly investigated and it remains a very, very deep wound in the psyche of uh, um, Kashmiris. Um, and a very recently a very good book has been written by a very young group of Kashmiri women about the uh, Kunan Koshpura rape. And why I mentioned this is I did have images of Kunan Koshpura. But I actually shared it with that group of women and they had have been meeting with people in the village very regularly. And I said to them that you know, I would like to be able to use this image in the book because it's such an iconic incident. And they said, if you ask us, uh, we wouldn't use it because the women are fed up of having their, you know, they're fed up, fed up of being iconic. You know, that they don't want to be represented once more as this village where women were raped. They've had enough. You know, they've not got justice. They don't want you to go on. Whatever. So. Just in deference to that, because I think these women, rather than me ask somebody or leave it to my own judgment, these women have spent the last two years meeting these women very regularly, so I just decided to drop the image. Um, the other question of why the most sort of dramatic uh, you know, news, news images are not there, partially because I wanted this to be a book of those images which um, are not in the center of the action, you know. Uh, I, as a filmmaker, uh, have often been, um, I am very interested in the before and after, um, and the, the, the eccentric view to the side and so on. So, you know, yes, uh, and, I, and I believe that sometimes uh, by not having those images, you can actually build a much richer uh, sense of what goes on in that world, because sometimes that um, that one dramatic images, image which sort of sucks up your brain and you know draws all your attention. I think that um, it, it gives you a kind of cathartic, oh my god, look at this image, and then you know that's it. Whereas um, a gentler kind of meandering around, you know, I think that it has more productive uh, possibilities. Uh, you know, uh, if you look at, if you look online for images of Kashmir, you will see a very clear dichotomy between either very beautiful touristy images of Kashmir, which are all about you know flowers and trees and lakes and mountains, that that image of Kashmir, or you will see a you know I call it Kashmir the beautiful Kashmir the cruel, which is the other, which is all about you know the, as if that the whole thing that the only thing is, is an Islamist militancy, which is what you would also often read about in the, in the world papers, because the, the reality is, of course, uh, you know, a lot more complicated and involves uh, issues of freedom and self-determination and has a long political history. And, uh, and I think the, the, you know, this book weaves between the, the different images from often, you know, interesting unconventional perspectives. And, and that, I think, is a is an important part of challenging that exoticization that uh, you know that people who live in that place don't experience it as the this exotic elsewhere uh, last year there was this book on on the lake district here in england you know which was about representing the lake district as a working landscape so when you know when people come and they go to the lake district and it's like oh so beautiful but for people who are farmers there and struggling it's a working landscape so in uh, you know in that sense, I think that, that challenging that exoticization was uh, really interesting. So, because you referred to... Uh, can, I, can I add something yeah. which might be interesting? It's also very interesting that a lot of... When, I mean, I've been now going to Srinagar regularly from 2003. A lot of young Kashmiris also have a lot of guilt about the pleasures of the beautiful Kashmir. I have friends who had not visited the Mughal gardens ever, you know. It was just something they did not do. They went, you know, in their early 20s for the first time, saying that, you know, through the troubles, it just seemed wrong. When so much was going wrong, what the hell, are you going to go to some beautiful garden, you know, you know, so there has been actually a very complicated relationship with the abundant beauty and the, you know, the gorgeousness of the Kashmiri landscape that people it has troubled people that, you know, maybe we have to stop looking at it. And so even in the narratives, most of them always speak very dismissively of, I didn't want to shoot that, you know, pretty stuff, the lakes, mountains. You know, it's almost like perverse. You, you almost shut your eyes to the beauty because it seems almost obscene to be, 
exulting in the beauty when life around you is, you know, going to shreds. Mm -hmm. so, so it, is, it is the world's most, you know, heaviest militarized zone, and, and the militarization of the landscape is very obvious to anybody who visits Srinagar or, or Kashmir Valley. Um, so, because we were talking about Kunan Kashmira, so on Friday actually we had an event here, and, and previously we've had SR and SR Bhattu, who's one of the authors of that book on uh, Kunan Kashmira. And uh, so, we, you know, and one of the questions that came up was about this do Kashmiris have solidarity with other struggles like Palestine or Tibet? And I actually referred to this image in your book from the, you know, from 86, I think, where, where there's a rally in Srinagar in solidarity for Palestine. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted you to maybe say a little bit more about these solidarities, you know, how, how what's yes. your... So it's a very thing. interesting image and it's there just for exactly for that reason. And I know that many Indians who pick up that book, uh, often more than the other dramatic images in the book, they are very struck by that first image. Because you have actually uh, five or six of... Uh, people who later became very important figures in the uh, armed resistance, uh, you know, very smartly turned out in leather jackets and berets and very kind of continental in, in the way they appear. Um, and they're actually there in support for Palestine, you know. And I think like many such sort of liberation movements, they began, began in a place of uh, quite, uh, you know, sort of, how should I say, very expansive notions of what politics is. But when you get beaten down, um, you tend to become more narrow in your outlook, you know, and you tend to draw sustenance from very limited sources. So I think that uh, that image is there in the book only to trigger this thought, you know, uh, which is not to say, I mean, even today, I think that uh, there's hardly anything that happens in Palestine, which is not reflected at least in a protest or two in Kashmir. Uh, and I think that young Kashmiris may not know much about what's happening uh, in many parts of the world, but they certainly do follow what's happening in, in Palestine. So there is that. Uh, but yeah. yeah. Mm, no Gaza over a bridge. Yes. And actually, I, I find that increasingly the young people, you know, it's I think that image is also interesting because it, it shows the, the narrowing of the spectrum and yes. were it not for this excessive force, the yes. you know all the other violent things, the uh, in, in, inter, interference with elections, that perhaps that the broad expansive scope of what the Kashmiris were yes. fighting for and struggling for would not have gone to you know through this funnel of what what the 90s led led people and, to. And I want to add an interesting detail. You know this. I refer to this anthology that I had edited in 2011, which is called "Until My Freedom Has Come," and the subtitle of the book is "The New Intifada in Kashmir." And Natasha also has a piece in that book. You cannot imagine how upset Indians were with that subtitle. They didn't have any problem with the title of the book. But the fact that you dared to make a connection between what was happening in Kashmir with Palestine and say, how dare you, you know, it's like, that's a real cause. And particularly the Indian left who are very, very supportive of the Palestinian movement. So last year in 2016, we had this utterly fascinating period of four months when Kashmir was being clobbered by the, the pellet guns and everything. And the Indian leftists were having rallies for Palestine and, you know, but there was not a word out of them about Kashmir. You know, so on Facebook, in the worst period, I've seen these guys posting these long tirades about what is going on in Palestine. And you want to say, but have you noticed what's happening in a corner of what is your country? You know? So I think that, um, uh, and then I do remember that that subtitle was put there as a provocation and it worked even today. I mean, Detractors will say, oh, that fellow who thinks this is the Intifada. And you know, like, it's like, how dare you muddle these two things together. The, yeah, I mean, Kashmir in, in the Indian imagination has this, this peculiar place, which is, you know, which is claimed as an integral, and yet the idea of democracy, human rights, all of that, has very little meaning in a place where you have emergency powers, such as what's called the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, which has been in place for over two and a half decades which means that there cannot be any prosecutions of armed forces for any excesses. 
And this is just one tiny detail of that entire situation. So for 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 you know for a generation who's just grown up with that, it is you know it is to inherit all of that as as your lived memory. And um, and the idea of you know freedom, as I mentioned, azadi is is the word for freedom. So in in Kashmir, you know, you would hear people say, "Hum kya chahte hain azadi," which is what we want. We want freedom. And uh, you know, and if in in the in the in India, if you know, there are people who are charged with sedition and labeled anti-nationalists if they even talk about Kashmir or its freedom. So the the discourse is just that uh, dissociated and and um, unable to deal with that reality. Should we go to the questions now, and then maybe come back to the conversation later? Okay. So. Um, this is your chance to ask questions, to give us your thoughts, your reflections, comments, point, points of view. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for um, the presentation. I think it's a great book and the photographs are just amazing. Um, I just have a question about the last uh, photographer, Azan Shah. Sure. Yeah, and um, you know, because most of the pictures are taken from inside, like certain places. Are the people who are being photographed you know that they're being photographed? So, um, that's an interesting question because the same would apply to photojournalists also. So I often wonder, uh, and I, I say this from because I'm a documentary filmmaker, so we do the same. So if I go to shoot a public protest, it's okay. I'm not asking anybody what's going on, you know. So I think your question is a hell of a question because um, I don't know, I don't have a straightforward answer to that. And I don't think Azam would have a straightforward answer to that. So ultimately, what does it boil down to that absurd thing that I have to be put against a, stand, a, a kind of standard of ethical practice. That that man walking does not know I'm just shooting from my hip, which someone like Azam will often do. He won't even pick the camera up. You know, he just sit there and keep clicking till he gets an image that he thinks is interesting. Um, what is he doing with that image? You know, for example, if, if I was making a film for a television channel in Britain, uh, I would have to. Uh, take permission, I would have to get them to sign a piece of paper, I would get them to pay for it. Does that make it more ethical? I don't believe so. I would, as a matter of principle, never get a consent form signed. Because simply because you sign a consent form, I mean, I talk to you for one hour, and what are you going to do with that material? You have no editorial control. So, you understand what I'm trying to say? That it's a very complicated the idea of consent is actually a very complicated thing. <coughs> and um, I think that the question must be asked. But I think that question must be debated and not legislated, you know, in some sort of way. That uh, is it the same thing? You see, if, if I enter a house where there's a funeral going on, as how often, often happens with these photographers, women are in grief. I'm crying over my brother's death. Is it ethical for me to take a picture at that moment? Because there's no time to ask. Now, you would have very, very conflicting points of view, and some of them are cultural. You know, some of the photographers have told me they worked in Afghanistan, and in Afghanistan they can't get near a funeral. Whereas in Kashmir, people will allow uh, you to come into the house even before the burial. And allow, I mean, not that they're going to encourage you, but they're not supposed to stop you because they think it's important for you to witness what you have seen. Javed Dar is a beautiful story of 2016, which I've written about, where uh, they got a call, you know, there had been a protest on the outskirts of Srinagar, and the police had fired at these young boys, and it's, it's in Harvard, which is, you know, it's about the forest. So one boy had disappeared and everybody was up in arms saying that you killed him and the police said no, he's run into the forest. And next day his body was found and the police said all the bears got him. But when the body was recovered, it was full of pellets, you know. So he describes how they started getting calls from the family saying, come and take the picture. 
And literally the funeral was held up for an hour and a half while the photographers came. Photojournalists. It was not a forensic photograph that they wanted. They wanted photojournalists there. So I think that I think that uh, this whole territory is a devilishly complicated one. But the one thing I'm sure about is that law and legality in the ways that we know it, because the law and legality only protects the powerful. It only protects a filmmaker who's making a film for Channel 4 and has a budget to pay you 5,000 rupees to give me an interview. You know? Uh, I once shot a film in England in 1990 with young British Asians who were trying to make it in the arts. And I worked with a women's theatre group and they said to me that we are all union uh, members and we can't work for free. You have to sign something. But you just give us one pound each. So I actually gave each of those women one pound and they signed a sheet of paper because that was their union rules. You know? So I am very complicated in my response to that, this question about what, you know, what is, it should be talked about. Every film that we see, this question must be raised, it must be debated, we must pillory a filmmaker who does it badly, we must, you know, but we mustn't legislate it because these are not things like, like marriage, it can't be raised. I would, uh... Yeah, I mean, I think I was just looking through Azan's uh, write-up and, uh, it, you know, he says, I don't say much or I pretend to be a tourist. I even let people think I'm a foreigner and I try to avoid confrontation. And he's talking about how that, some, you know, it's hard to explain when he's photographing people or photographing streets. And this is in the downtown, for example, the, the inner sort of, inner heart of the city. People, place, inhabited very much, houses. So he, he says that, uh, you know, it's, um, people just say, why are you taking pictures of us? We're just regular people who take pictures of the mountains or something. So he's, he's talking about how getting close to people requires that patience. And ideally, you know, from what I'm reading, ideally he would like, like he would have liked to be invisible so that he could just do that. But I think that it's also a personal thing that, you know, that every person taking pictures uh, decides for themselves. So, uh, you know, I, I was just trying to reflect, like when I have, because I, I have often wandered cities taking pictures, you know, uh, with a camera and sometimes done that for long periods of time. Or even recently in Srinagar, and I'm just thinking, is there isn't a hard and fast way in which you can, you can explore, you can sort of enact that personal ethics? Because if it is somebody, you feel that you, you, you're not, you don't want to objectify somebody. So if you're taking a picture of someone, wherever possible, and if it is possible, you would ask them if it's okay. You know, if, if you think that that's just a picture of a person sitting somewhere, and perhaps you could also go and then show them the, that picture, which, which makes them feel that they know what the image is. At other times, say if it's a protest or something, and people are, are in distances, or the figure is a receiving one, then, then because that person is not really identified so much, and is not, you know, you're not really sort of, identifying them in the picture, then I think people would say maybe that's okay because you also don't want to run after somebody who's in a, in a situation where they're not identified because by the time you get to speak to them, they've probably gone somewhere else or the whole scene is gone. So I think that, um, that, that's, that that's an interesting question, but also that ethics is something that people negotiate personally. And in his case, uh, unlike the others who are often working, he actually makes it a point of saying that you know, I don't mind being a salesperson, but I don't want to do this for a living. I just want to do this because if I don't take pictures for a week, I feel like I need to. So it's, it's, I think it depends on a lot of factors, how a person relates to that. The other interesting thing is, of course, that the people often have interconnections. These people who are these photographers often have friendships and mentorships like yes. uh, Azan and Sherya know each other. Yes. And it was, I thought that was quite interesting too. Um, yeah. My, Sorry, I didn't hear him. My question, um, you said you had a, um, a launch in New Delhi yes. last month, and we can see that you got support from the India Foundation for the yes. Arts, given what you said and what everybody knows anyway, that Kashmir is not a favorite subject of conversation. Yes. Can you say something about that? Um, so this is quite interesting. Uh, I do believe that in the last decade, 10 years, there has been a shift in public opinion. Uh, I think that um, uh, the fact that the Indian Foundation for the Arts, which is a very small 
uh, it's not a government, it's a non-governmental, it's a little private trust with a little bit of money. Uh, they give small amounts of money to artists. Uh, I don't believe that they've ever done anything like this before. And I think that they are very proud of it. It's kind of like a badge of honor, you know, that yes, they've done something. So I think that's very interesting. Um, does it mean that public opinion has changed? No. But uh, we have had, for example, three or four major reviews in the Indian press. And uh, all of them have been very sort of nuanced, mature. Uh, yesterday or day before, uh, the kind of, I would say, center-right magazine, which is called India Today, it's a news weekly, has a four-page spread on the book. And with quite a decent review as well. So. Um, I think that um, while opinion may not have shifted, there's definitely a crack, you know, and all of this has helped writers, novelists, journalists, photographers, young students. I think the most effective thing actually has been the presence of Kashmiri students on campuses in India. Because simply by their presence, by their politics, by their activism, they have actually persuaded their cohort that there's something going on, you know, which you have to pay attention to. So I would say that uh, even as India is going through a major right-wing kind of upsurge, I think the conversation around Kashmir has many, many more takers. Uh, in fact, the, the launch that I referred to, we had maybe 250 people in an open-air amphitheater. And at the end of the day, in the evening, we all laughed about the fact that this is the first Kashmir event that we had attended in a decade where there was no trouble. Mm -hmm. Nobody asked, an, you know, like an awkward question. Or where, was, where was that? In the India Habitat Center, which is in the heart of Delhi. It's like a public space and it was open. You know. So um, we took some pleasure out of it that it means that something is shifting. You know, it's not a big deal, but it's shifting. May I, may I just yes. ask a follow-up on that? So, do you think that it's just the fact that the discourse on Kashmir is shifting, which would be a an optimistic, hopeful thing that we would all like? Or is it, do you think, the fact that these are personal stories and it's about an, you know, an art form and the fact that these are photographs somehow um, you know, somehow circumvents the kinds of things that they would come and protest because they don't want politics and maybe that is, you know, maybe that that is a testament to the way in which that politics can be the way through art, you know, bypassing some of that outright. Uh, See, I think the uh, kind of exactly. outrage that Kashmir attracts is irrespective of the provocation offered. It does not have anything to do with the content of what you're saying. I mean, it's just that how dare you talk about Kashmir? You know, is that crude actually? So I don't think that people who have to protest are not going to wait to open the book and say, so what is the form and what are the modalities? They're just going to be upset because you put images of Kashmir together and it's not to his catalog, you know. So I think that, um, uh, yeah, I mean, because this, the notion of who raises his or her voice, uh, according to me, because I've had some experience with this with my own film, that the, the trouble always comes from people who do it as a career option, you know. It's like something that they do, they create trouble. There's no such thing as people being upset, and I don't buy that. I think that people are upset, but they don't want to stop you from showing your film or stop you from putting your book out. You know, I think that that happens That's from the best yeah, organized yes. sort of that thing. Yes. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Thank you. One is connected to the first question. Is specifically, I was looking at Shortcut Nanda's picture where he uh, photographed uh, those, you know, boy yeah, boys. Boys. Yeah. they were running away. Just, I'm just wondering to what extent, for instance, we do know that police goes after yes. the. Uh, so called film filters after years to find out what kind of make I'm just wondering about the safety issue related. So that's a very interesting story. The reference here is to Shakatanda's series of portraits of the young boys who were on the run in Baramula. Now he obviously spoke to them and told them this is what I want to do, and he took the pictures. And interestingly, uh, those pictures were carried in the Washington Post. Uh, they have a very nice uh, photo uh, thing online. And in some twisted sort of way, it became a protection for the boys. And one of the boys, his pictures in the book, uh, actually uh, he got hit by a bullet. 
and the bullet was extracted and for a long time he used to wear it around his neck. And he actually gifted it to Shokan, you know, which is like a, the most, one of the most precious things he had. And he told me recently that some of the boys, as they follow the fortunes of these images in the book or whatever, they actually are following on Twitter. And so he gets likes from those boys. So it's a, it's a weird thing, you know, it's, you would imagine that it's a kind of, it's jeopardizing them. But sometimes a certain kind of visibility uh, also gives you a kind of protection. Because these are the boys who are in the Washington Post. If they disappear, you know, there could be a noise about it. They're not anonymous anymore. So the loss of anonymity is actually a welcome thing rather than a negative thing. Sorry. No. I was just going to say that the fact that the photographers themselves are Kashmiris, I think is, is, you know, is a testament to the fact that they, they would not act in bad faith, you know, and, and in Shokats, for example, right, that is his approach and he talks about, you know, how one has to be concerned, one has to be humanistic. And I think that that, you know, maybe an ex somebody who comes from the outside may not have that understanding of that reality, but because they themselves are Kashmiri, I think that makes a difference too. Okay. The second connect to that, but not connected it. Uh, one of them talked about how since 2013 it becomes more dangerous because of pilots and use of different forms of violence by the state. And therefore they are more careful on reading the side of protesters. I'm just wondering, I haven't read the book, is to what extent in your experience, let's say document the occupier, the oppressor, rather you know, documenting the resistance, let's put it this way. And have, say, if you're on the side of the police, because you fear that the Cops would, uh, you know, basically regulate uh, on you or in the highlights. To what extent changes the nature of photography? I'm just wondering, therefore, has the nature of policing changed the type of photograph that journalists are taking? So one thing is that the journalists are under severe threat from the police. Uh, many of them have been very badly beaten up. Recently, this, these two young photographers were with Syed Sharyar and at fairly, you know completely unmilitated way the police turned to them and fired a pellet gun at not very far distance. So two photographers, uh, one photographer lost his eye in his way, uh, the other guy was very badly injured. So uh, there is tremendous tension between the paramilitary forces on the ground and the uh, photographers. Um, Including, for example, at the, you know, in, this, in the summer of 2016 where loads of people were blinded and people started arriving in the hospitals and obviously that's where the photographers went. And those images became viral, you know, I mean, for one want of a better barometer of how far word is spread, the New York Times carried a front page picture, they carried a story on the blinding. So next you know, photographers get beaten up in the hospital wards by people who are pretending to be relatives of the families but are actually very close policemen. You know, so they would enter the wards and say, who are you and you're exploiting this agony and so on and you know, whatever, whatever. So, uh, actually, the, the space, like I mentioned, Divish, that if in the 90s you could actually go and locate a militant group and take pictures of them posing for the camera and come back, today, uh, photographers really have to be very careful about where they can go. For example, I've written about it in the book. It's a situation in which photojournalists can never go alone. No photojournalists. I mean, normally what would be a photographer's instinct? That you go on your own, you know? Or you, if you go with a bunch of guys and you peel off and you do your own thing, but if you're a photographer in Kashmir, you cannot afford to do that. Because once you're alone, you'll get picked up. So it's only because they go in a bunch and then, you know, if the cops try to mess with one guy, then everybody sets up a big noise. And so it's a very, very regular, uh, they are under assault all the time. And they're also under assault by people sometimes, because people are angry. And the photographers are often the first people who come in the line of fire. You know? So this business of getting slapped and beaten up, it's, it's almost well, it's like a comic riff through the book, you know. And, they all say, well, you know, if you haven't been beaten up, you're not a Kashmiri photographer, you know. And you'll be beaten up by both the cops as well as the people. That's a true test, you know, otherwise you haven't quite made the cut. Thank you for attending this. I just wanted to know, like, uh, Kashmir has been uh, for a long time um, the continent of each state. Uh, so, uh, in your experience, what did you find that uh, the rate of the oppression from the state? Is increasing or decreasing, and uh, uh, what uh, response uh, from the international media did you find? Yeah. 
Can you repeat the question, please? Yes, yeah, so the question is that uh, has there been over these 30 years, is the uh, intensity of the uh, oppression by the state, has it come down, has it gone up? Um, and then what? how has the international media reflected this? See, the international media has been entirely uh, fickle and um, uh, like international media tends to be connected to foreign policy. So in the early 90s, for example, uh, you would find very exceptional reporting from Kashmir, uh, for example, in the American press. I mean, if you, if you start looking through the archives, you'll find that the New York Times did some very, very good stuff in the 90s. But once India becomes the emerging superpower, uh, which is what the British started by talking about, suddenly no one's interested. Yeah. Then uh, occasionally you'll find these sudden bursts of interest. Uh, so one has to look at it cynically and say, what's in it for them? Why are they suddenly talking about Kashmir? This year, what's it about Kashmir that makes the Western media interested? And why are they suddenly quiet about it when they should be talking about it? You know, so I think that it's actually like a little bit of a foreign policy puzzle rather than some genuine understanding or not. But also, and this has to be said, if you are a foreign correspondent in India, Maybe you can get away with one strong Kashmir story in a year, but if you do more than that and you do not get your visa extended, you might even get thrown out even if you have a visa. So, you know, it's it's totally um, very fragile. So, yeah. so there is happiness sometimes when stories make it. Like I said, front page story, lot of pellet landings, picture story, great story, uh, wonderful. But you can't expect that they're going to follow that story. There may not be another story on Kashmir for the next year. Not because something important is not happening, but because they've exhausted their quota for a year. You know? And you know, you have to face it, the world is a very terrible place. Terrible things are happening all the time. And the barometer always is not the ethical or moral, um, how should I say, the weight of what you are arguing for, but that they 10,000 people die in this last attack, or did 5,000 die, or, you know. So it's a marketplace of extreme grief and extreme bloodshed. So if, if only 120 people were killed over the summer, it's a blip in the global economy of sorrow and, and death. Um, about the intensity of the oppression, I don't believe that it has changed. It goes up and down uh, as the as the people protest on the streets build up, and so does the. Uh, so I mean, this 2016 in, in in some senses was, you know, there's always this. Uh, oh, but then 2011 was like that, and 2010 was like that, and 2008 was like you know like that. Each time you. How to do the, the previous stuff? Recent, the recent government, after the recent emergency, new government in India, what's the, what's the Well, um, let's just say this that if traditionally the Indian government has dealt with uh, Kashmir uh, through hypocrisy, now it's dealing with it with neglect, which is even worse. And I think that currently in this, this present dispensation, any kind of solution or even a reduction in the level of suffering of the people is not uh, currently in the interests of the government of India. Uh, it's in fact quite the opposite, that keeping it alive might well be, uh, uh, because you know, it's, yeah, Kashmir is an issue of great and nationalistic, it unites the country in absurd ways which uh, I have never been able to fathom how it works. So yeah, it's. Um, I, I'm not very hopeful that uh, this period will be at all good for Kashmir. Sure. Um, you know, just to uh, just to say that in terms of the international media, it's it's as Sanjay said, it is about you know this global economy of sorrow, and and as we all realize, it's also about where that sorrow is happening. So because these people are in Kashmir, because their identity is what it is, which is Kashmiri Muslims, because what they are what they are resisting is a democracy and a big market, all of that plays into how long you can you can sort of not cover a story of people being blinded or pellet guns being used or any of that. 
And then there comes a point, of course, that, at which it becomes impossible not to cover a story, right? Because there are all these young people blinded, there are people who are dying, ambulances being attacked. And then when the world media does start to cover the story, as it did in, you know, in, uh, towards the autumn of 2016, very soon you find that the framing of what's happening is dynamic and changes. So in the context of, of last year's uprising, what, when the world started to get more interested in world media, that was the point at which there was an, a, an Uri attack, which is on the border between India and Pakistan, and the entire discourse shifted from the blindings and the use of pelicans and the uprising to, oh, India-Pakistan, you know, possible border skirmishes, will there be another war, what about the nuclear powers? So it's also this, this uh, a very clever machine that, you know, through which all of this gets filled out and works. In terms of the repression, of, I mean, the, the, you know, the, in the 90s or if you think about in the past, it was, I think, a lot less sophisticated in terms of, you know, what it was doing. Whereas now, there are periods, of course, when that brutality is visible. But there are also times at which there are, you know, there's a whole lot of manipulation and oppression and all of that going on. But there are ways in which that is not represented, not able to get through. So it's, it's a, you know, it's a cle I think it's a cleverer means of oppression. And, and the, the strategy right now, from, you know, my observation seems to be anyway, that it's, it's about giving people this choice between, you know, in engaging with the state in some way in the name of development or to get a job to live and then dividing people further and that seems to, you know, it's, it's sort of making people dependent on for their economic opportunities on some sort of engagement with the state while at the same time dissipating, you know, solidarities and leadership. So it's it's not quite just neglect, I would say. It's, it's a, you know, it's polarization and it's it, it's that alienation being being enacted in very specific ways to disrupt the solidarity that Kashmiris have. And of course, these uprisings, as you said, you know, these cycles of uprisings every few years, who dies? The Kashmiris do, you know? It's, it's, the, it's the people there who are dying, so, and it's it all goes to the world media. Uh, um, um, yeah, so my question is about the young photographers themselves, because uh, I just want to know, like you said, they don't necessarily have the resources or the inf infrastructure to own their pho photographic talent and whatnot, because uh, I have some, uh, some mutual friends in the valley who I am Facebook friends with and I've met. Then all of a sudden, like these pe these friends of mine, they're artists, photographers, singers, and whatnot. Whenever I share their work, somehow these other artists get a get a hold of it, and then they send me a friend request saying, like, "Here's my work." One of them was a, a young photographer. He like took so many uh, great photos, which he just showed me. I never met this guy, and then like he just sent me all these photos. We just had a good rapport going. I'm just wondering, are there avenues as of now, like? support groups or unofficial, you know, uh, groups of sorts where these uh, yeah. people get together and own their talent. So, and, um, on the, uh, the internet is obviously the biggest influence as we now know. Um, in some uh, peculiar way, some of the younger guys, like say someone like Sayed Chenya, um, he actually makes a survey, he makes a living, a meager living, but a living nevertheless. Simply by putting his uh, pictures on some of these uh, online, you know, sites like Demotix, which are for people, whatever, sourced photo agencies. Uh, but you know, his pictures are appeared in the pages of Guardian because of that, and they appeared in La Figaro, you know, I mean, uh, clutch of French newspapers because that's the way it works. The net, you know, so that's great. Um, are there many, many photographers? Definitely. I mean, I follow them on Instagram, uh, you know, and there are some amazing young people. Um, but sadly, it's not as if there's a big cohort and there's a kind of, you know, there isn't. And one of the things that I'm hoping is that when we do this, having done this book, like I told you what the women photographers wanted, you know, that I think that you know, sometimes somebody first just coming to the outside and say what wonderful stuff is going on for people to say, yeah, what wonderful stuff is going on. You know? 
So I'm very hopeful that whether it's you know even things like I fantasize about raising you know a few hundred thousand rupees and buying two hundred of the greatest photo books in the world and parking them in a room in Srinagar and inviting the photographers to drop by and look at photo books. Because seeing pictures on the net is a very different experience from sitting with the work of Cartier Bresson, for example, and leafing through the book. You know. So uh, there are some of the universities do teach media in a sort of rudimentary way. Some of these photographers actually teach there. Uh, but it's, I mean, just some part level. You know. So people are just, people are learning things through the internet. You know, they're, they're finding out what their taste is. They're finding out the grades. Uh, you know, so it's amazing the names when you, when you ask these some of the younger photographers, who do you like? And the names they come up with, and you're using like, how did this guy even find the work of this photographer, you know? So that's the miracle of the internet, you know? Um, but sometimes, and that's the danger of the internet, that, you know, it, 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 you can reach the universe, but you might forget to make the solidarities in the same room as you. you know? So I think that is why a book project of this kind hopes to, I've said this in the introduction, saying that this is a, you know, it's a, it's a flag, you know, it's a marker in the ground. We just put something down and say, okay, around this, maybe we can do something. You know, I don't want to do it. That's not what I want to spend the rest of my life doing. But I think the photographers might do something. And the younger generation are fantastic. They're really very, uh, they're not at all self-centered. They do have a sense of community, and that's really, really there. Thank you. Yes, are you planning to have a presentation of this book also in Sri Lanka? Yes. Yes. I mean, yes. um, listening from what you're saying, yes. uh, it must be very different. Yeah, so uh, in my experience, if you want to do something in uh, Kashmir, it helps to uh, do, you know, kind of, as I say, gingerly go around uh, the, the, you know, to create some awareness about the book, which is what we've tried to do. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm doing these. Uh, so that by the time you actually get to Sri Lanka, uh, even if anybody wants to stop you, then they have to think twice about it because you've already got a certain visibility. So going straight off and doing the first thing in Srinagar would be a little foolish. Uh, so yes, in April, I mean, I'm actually very interested in doing sessions in the educational institution and we kind of pick four places where we think we could do workshop where we have faculty who we think might be interested in. But we also do a more public uh, thing because, you know, the, at least eight of them are live in Sri Lanka. And where would be like a movie theater? Or oh, it's, uh, or a... there are no public halls actually, and that's not an accident. Uh, uh, there isn't a place where you can uh, actually call 250 people and do a event like this. You know, so it would have to be in a hotel uh, where you hire a room. Very good chances that you get cancelled at the last time. And the police will tell the. This happens all the time there. Uh, but the important thing is that you know that you do it. So, you know, you have several options open. Uh, it's really quite crazy, actually. Uh, even an innocent discussion around a book is not an innocent discussion around a book. It becomes very low. There isn't a cinema. There isn't a cinema. Uh, there isn't a cinema in, in, uh, in Kashmir. And there's the ruins of a cinema, the Palladium cinema, in the center at, in Lal Chowk, which is Lal Chowk literally translates into Red Square, which goes back to its uh, leftist progressive roots, you know, of, of what was happening in Kashmir. But yeah, there's it's there's a, a, a ruin of a cinema which is where which is where this one of the security camps or whatever is. So you have lots of soldiers. There are no places like that where people can gather. Yeah, somebody, you had a question. Um, could you talk a little bit more about uh, the initial response you've had in Kashmir uh, about the book? You mentioned it very briefly, but so uh, as of now, very few people actually, because very few copies have actually gone across. Um, uh, I mean, there is so little material about Kashmir that invariably this kind of thing is really received very well. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm not, that that doesn't make me nervous at all, you know, like I know that, because I have done work in the past and I know that uh, people have been very, very uh, forthcoming and 
understood the value. Because, you know, in a sense, it is a position of privilege that someone like myself is coming from. I'm also, I can pull off something like this because I live in Delhi, you know. I can persuade the Prince Klaus Fund and India Foundation for the Arts to put in some money and, you know. I can self-publish this book and therefore not have to deal with publishers and their sense of whatever. So, I'm under no illusion that what I have done is not a uh, byproduct of the privilege that I have accumulated through 30 years of work. But then, that's what privilege is there for. You know? So, having done that, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, it would be uh, vain of me to say that people are going to love the book, but uh, I know that it will. I just wanted to say one thing because I think we're close to uh, wrapping up. The last part of the book is actually something I'm very proud of. Uh, it's what we call the yellow pages. Um, it's, it's sort of for various reasons, it's also printed on very different paper. Every image in the book is actually listed chronologically and it has very detailed captions. So it's not simply policemen injured in grenade attack, but it can tell you what day, who, where, what happened, and so on. And uh, what we've also done is that there are certain words that recur uh, through the book. And there's a list of 15 words that we made, which kind of, if you know the answers to these 15 words, then you might have understood something about Kashmir, you know. So, uh, actually we have notes on those 15 words, and those words are highlighted through the, through the book, in all the captions. What's so, a, what's an example of a word? So, yeah. I, I'll tell you, uh, disappeared is a word, mm -hmm. elections is a word, uh, militant is a word, paramilitary is a word, Counterinsurgency is a word, crackdown is a word, Kashmiri Pandit is a word, J JK, Jammu Kashmir Liberation Front is a word, Hizbul Mujahideen is a word. So it's just a set of 15 sort of key words and in a sense we hope that those can be read separately, that when you are done with the pictures, maybe six months later you might turn to the, uh, to the text at the back and, and read it. Not then we should. Uh, I think it's time to, to finish. So, so thank you very much to all of you for being here and to Sanjay for this uh, incredible book. And once again, to acknowledge all the photographers whose work and stories are in it. Um, uh, I would just encourage you to just go and read and get to know more about Kashmir and, if possible, someday even to see because. It isn't, you know, as we know, it's you know, it, there, it is surrounded by these mountains and it is beautiful, but it's also guarded by barbed wires and there are soldiers and there are, you know, mass graves and all of that. So it's, it's, it matters to know about these things because, you know, oppressions interconnect and and it is important to the understanding of. Uh, you know, if you are if you if you are familiar with India, it is important. But even if you are not, it is important for you to be familiar with Kashmir, whether you are an Indian or uh, you know somebody based here. So thanks to all of you for. Can for I just say one other thing that we have a similar uh, event, event Suas, yeah. at Suas on Friday at 7 p.m. And so if you have uh, friends who might be interested and who couldn't make it for any reason, they should. Uh, Try and come. <coughs> we'll have copies of the book, so if some people are not able to get copies today, then you can show up there and we'll, we'll have it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. And please continue to come to our events because this is this is an important part of you know how we link the, the program with uh, with the events that we organize around the Dharma Jai Bhavas program and our second poster in the IR. Uh, Dimish would like to say something. Uh, before thank you. Uh, we have been there. This event was 